Welcome to St. Louis County Library's virtual program, Garden Maintenance for Wildlife, A New Way to Garden, presented by Scott Woodbury of the Shaw Nature Reserve as part of the Partners for Native Landscaping webinar series. I'm Sarah Jones, Adult Programming Coordinator for St. Louis County Library. Before we get started, I wanted to bring to your attention a few uh, tips in case this is your first webinar program with us. Um, so the fact that this is a webinar does mean that we cannot see or hear you, but you should be able to see and hear us. So please adjust uh, the volume on your device if you need to. Uh, we are recording, so if you um, so this this will be available to you on our web page, our YouTube page, uh, within a few days, and you'll receive an email when the link uh, is posted. So we also have subtitles, and if you click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen, you can turn them off or on, and you can make them bigger or smaller, uh, but those are all functions you'll find under that live transcript button. If you experience any difficulties with your connection, we do recommend that you exit the webinar and try to move closer to your, web, um, your Wi-Fi router, and you can rejoin us with the link that you used to get in initially. And as I mentioned, we are recording, so if you miss anything, you'll have the chance to catch up when that is posted. Uh, we also have the, the chat turned on during the program, so feel free to submit any questions or comments you have as they occur to you, uh, but those will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Remember, you don't need to have a library card with St. Louis County Library or even be a resident of the county in order to attend our virtual programs. Uh, we just want you to enjoy yourself, uh, learn, hopefully learn something new, and feel free to share that with your family and friends and invite them to, um, to check out our next uh, programs or what's on our YouTube channel. Uh, today's program is a part of the Partners for Native Landscaping series, and the next couple of programs are uh, tomorrow evening at uh, 7 p.m., Wednesday, March 30th. We have Landscaping with Native Plants presented by Allison Joyce of the Missouri Botanical Garden and Cody Hayo of Pretty City Gardens and Landscapes. And then uh, next Tuesday, April 5th at 2 p.m., we have a Homegrown National Park presented by Jean Ponzi. You can register for these events and the other programs in the series or any SLCL program by going to www.slcl.org slash events. Also, don't forget you can catch up on almost any program and every program of this series uh, by checking out the library's YouTube channel. I'll put the link to both our events and the YouTube channel in the chat momentarily, um, as well as a survey to provide uh, Partners for Native Landscaping with some feedback about today's webinar. But now I would like to introduce you to this afternoon's presenter. Scott Woodbury is a horticulturist at Shaw Nature Reserve, where he has been developing and managing the Whitmire Wildflower Garden for 30 years. He is a consultant and author on the subject of native landscaping practices. Thank you so much for being with us, Scott, and uh, for being a partner in this series as well. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Sarah. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you all for uh, for coming to this um, this presentation. I I'm just pulling up my screen right now. And give me a second. There we go. Um, I want to start out by um, acknowledging um, some of our partners uh, at Shaw Nature Reserve. Um, what we do at Shaw Nature Reserve with native landscaping would not be possible um, without the, the generous support from two organizations. Um, Wild Ones um, has a St. Louis chapter that supports um, education programming at Shaw Nature Reserve. And the Missouri Department of Conservation um, is a big supporter of our program. And without them, we would not be able to bring this material to you. Um, we're super uh, grateful for St. Louis County Library and this opportunity to partner with them on the Partners for Native Landscaping uh, Native Plant Workshop. And um, it's great because uh, we have a different audience than we normally do, and a larger audience, and a greater ability to reach out across the community. So um, thanks to Sarah, thanks to the County Library for helping, uh, helping partner with us and helping us get our word out. I am going to talk about something that um, 
that may be new to some of you. Uh, we, as well, anybody who's gardened um, probably has uh, learned how to garden a certain way. And if you've gardened long enough, like I have, um, go way back in time, um, you probably um, can recollect all sorts of gardening techniques that um, we once thought were quite common and quite um, appropriate and the way to do things. And over the years, over the decades, I've discovered that um, that we can do things a little bit differently in our garden. We can maintain our gardens in a little bit different way to um, especially promote wildlife. And these are just really simple things. Um, they may not seem so simple. They may be new to you. Um, it may not be the, the, the thing that you learned in school or um, from your parents or your grandparents. Um, but they are things that I've come to realize make a huge difference in our gardening practices. So let's get started. Um, the first thing that I always like to promote and talk about when it comes to promoting wildlife, um, it, we just can't promote wildlife. We cannot support wildlife if we don't have native plants um, in our landscape. And so um, you will, if you start looking for native plants, you might be overwhelmed by the numbers of them. There's over 1,200 species in Missouri, and maybe five or 700 of them are useful for gardening, and maybe uh, a couple hundred of them are for sale in the marketplace. Um, there's still a lot of species, and so um, to help you focus, especially if you're a beginner gardener, um, we have this top performing plant list, this top performing native plant list that's on the Shaw Nature Reserve website. And um, you can probably find this in lots of places, but if you go to the Shaw Nature Reserve website and start moving around the, um, the home gardener um, area, you will discover this pretty quickly. Um, another excellent resource is for native plants are the top 10 guides that are published at Grow Native. And you can go to the Grow Native website and, um, and see um, a growing list, maybe a couple dozen lists of top 10 native plants. Um, native plants for, um, for rain gardening, plants with winter interests, plants, uh, top 10 evergreen plants, on and on and on and on. There's so many different specific lists of plants. Um, and these can be very useful to you as you um, try to wind your way down to um, the top performers, the best plants for our region, the plants that are going to succeed um, above all others. Uh, so native plants. If you don't have a native plant, um, you're not going to be able to um, connect with nature in the same way that, that non-native plants uh, do. And, um, and one thing that I want to mention before I move on is that um, if you haven't read Doug Tallamy's books, um, um, Bring Nature Home is, is a really great place to start. Um, Doug Tallamy is a, an entomologist from, from Delaware, and he talks about relationships between native plants and the insects um, that we have in our region. Um, if we don't have native plants, we will not have the insects. And you might think, well, who cares about having a bunch of insects in the garden? Um, but I will tell you, as Tallamy has, um, that um, caterpillars fuel baby birds. And if we do not have um, native plants, we will not have native caterpillars, butterfly and moth caterpillars, um, which will fuel um, successful nesting of baby birds. Um, so there's this amazing relationship. It all starts with native plants, and that's a great place to start to promote um, wildlife. Now that's not maintenance, um, but it does relate to maintenance because if you don't pick um, at least the top performers, the top performing native plants, you will struggle and you may not have, um, you might have more difficulty with your maintenance practices. So starting with top performing native plants is a great way to reduce maintenance. It's a great way to attract wildlife. 
All right, I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the basics. Um, as I said before, um, turf, gra uh, turf grass is something that, um, that many of us have in our landscapes. Most of us probably have some turf grass in our landscapes. Um, discovering how much turf grass versus garden is something that, um, uh, that you'll probably encounter and think about. Um, at least I hope you do, because um, especially if you um, if you have a family like like mine, um, you need some turf grass, and so turf grass is um, is useful. Um, it's the only plant that we have right now that um, that withstands heavy foot traffic. Um, there aren't too many alternatives that work as well as good old tall fescue. Now fescue is not a native plant. Um, but and we don't and we have too much of it, so we don't really need to promote too much um, turf grass. We want to reduce the amount of turf grass in our landscape. But if you are going to have activities, um, you know, throwing a football, playing baseball, having pathways, um, having um, edges around your garden and around your house, um, then turf grass really can't be beat. It's uh, unfortunately that's where we are right now. Um, some people, however, um, get dis they discover native plants. They get hooked on native plants, and their goal is to remove all the turf grass in the yard completely. Now, this is wonderful. It's great for wildlife. Um, if you have the ability to maintain this much native garden, um, that's great. If your neighbors are okay with it, that's great. Um, but they oftentimes... Um, they oftentimes change once the ownership of the property changes. And so keep that in mind. This is a before, this is a sad before and after um, pair of photographs where you have the before here and then the homeowner after selling the property, after having a difficult time trying to sell this property because there was so much garden. Um, not, not many people have the ability to do this much gardening. Um, the garden reverted back to um, all turf grass. So, uh, you know, a big swing from, well, in the beginning, no, uh, nothing but turf grass, and then um, big garden, and then back to turf grass. So, um, anyway, I think that a good place to start for most people is um, having a garden that may be relatively small, 150, 200, 200 square feet, 250 square feet. Um, this is a good place to start because, um, because turf grass is relatively easy to care for compared to a garden. So small gardens uh, work well for be beginner gardeners. Um, they work well for people who may not have the capacity to garden. Um, and, but keep in mind that small gardens also um, typically have low plant diversity. And so if you have low plant diversity, you will have less potential to attract wildlife. So there's another um, thing that can increase the amount of wildlife that you bring to your landscape, increasing the species diversity, increasing the number of types of plants in your, um, in your landscape. And that, that sometimes means that you'll, you'll wanna have a bigger garden. Um, so let's keep that in mind because we're gonna be talking about um, wildlife diversity um, later in this talk. Okay. Back to lawns. Um, I like looking at, um, I like thinking about lawns um, because we have so much of them. Um, are these lawns well cared for? I guess it depends on who you're asking. Um, the um, Homeowners Associ Association might say, yes, these lawns are really well taken care of. Uh, there's no weeds, they're cut very perfectly. Um, they're, they're performing really well, um, but are they healthy? And I think that's the question that, um, that I'm trying to, to ask in this presentation. Are these kinds of landscapes uh, truly healthy for our communities, healthy for our environment? Um, back to Doug Tallamy, he tells us that um, there are 40 million acres, 40 million plus acres of turf in the United States, and that that is more um, area than we have national parks. Is that a, a healthy thing for the planet? Probably not. 
Um, why? Here's why. Um, when we take care of lawns and try to make them perfect, we are adding chemicals that help them look as good as they do, quote unquote good. Um, we, the chemicals that we put down are usually in the form of granular fertilizers, granular um, herbicides. Um, and you see the, the uh, companies spreading these fertilizers right now. This is the time of year that they're doing it. I saw one yesterday. And, um, and what happens is um, these, these fertilizer pellets, um, they don't always stay put. Um, if they're not installed, uh, if they're not um, put down properly, if they end up on a hard surface like a sidewalk, um, the first rain that comes along washes them straight down into the storm drain. Once they go down into the storm drain, um, they end up in, the near, in a nearby creek, and then from the creek it goes to a river, and from a river it goes into the, um, the mother of all rivers, the Mississippi, which ends up in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, look at the size of the um, watershed for the Mississippi River. It reaches as far west as Idaho, and it goes into Canada even a little bit, and as far east as western New York State and west, western Pennsylvania. And that is a huge watershed with a lot of agricultural lands, a lot of um, it's, just, it's ag lands, it's also homeowner and private lands where turf grass is being managed that um, builds up this fertilizer um, load in our waterways. And what happens, um, it all ends up down in the Gulf of Mexico and forms this what's called a hypoxic zone. And this hypoxic zone is some years bigger than others depending on the spring floods and the fertilizer loads that um, are carried in those floods. But basically, the, these areas are um, a, a bloom, huge blooms of um, uh, algae. And this, this algae um, um, sucks up oxygen and other nutrients, and it starves the waters in the Gulf of Mexico, waters that, um, that could be um, excellent fishing grounds or not good fishing grounds. They're excellent shrimping grounds, but they're no longer ex excellent shrimping grounds. If anything that can't move out of this hypoxic zone essentially um, suffers and dies. And so this is a huge problem in the Gulf. It's a huge problem for our fisheries. Um, it's a huge problem for all of the creeks between the Gulf and where we live in our own backyards. Um, so, uh, so fertilizer loading is really um, the main concern. There's a lot of other chemicals that are in, um, in fertilizers, but I propose that we think about what a healthy lawn really is. Um, this is my backyard. Um, I think this is a healthy backyard. Um, I've got a lot of dandelions and my, my son spent his childhood picking dandelions and blowing dandelion seeds. Um, our lawn is full of violets um, and we spend time picking violets and putting them in our salads. Uh, now, we don't have a dog, and so we don't have any um, of that kind of fertilizer in our yard, so we feel pretty good about picking violets in the backyard and consuming them. Uh, we don't use any chemicals in our yard whatsoever. Um, there are clovers, there are other weeds that are growing in this lawn. Um, I like to think that this lawn is a healthy lawn. Um, we mow it a little bit taller. We mow it at about four inches in height. Maybe it's three and a half, depending on how um, tall your lawnmower can be. Um, and when we mow it taller, um, we're also mowing it um, with larger um, frequencies between um, uh, larger gaps between the frequencies. So we might be mowing it every two weeks instead of every week and a half. Um, and when we do this, we give those flowering plants in between all of the, the grass, the turf grass, we give those flowering plants a chance to bloom. Now, why do we care about weeds blooming in a lawn? Um, Gerardo Camilo, um, a, bee, a biologist from St. Louis University, has done a lot of research and his grad students have done a lot of research and have found that um, parts of St. Louis that have a lot of weedy diversity in turf grass or in abandoned areas or in sidewalk cracks. 
um, have more bee species diversity and more and greater numbers of bees than parts of St. Louis that do not have weeds. Um, and so this is one way that we can promote wildlife. We can garden differently simply by changing the way that we manage turf grass. As I said before, there are no equals to turf grass in terms of withstanding um, heavy foot traffic. Unfortunately, right now we have nothing that really compares. Um, so why not um, maintain our, our, our lawns a little bit differently? Leave some weeds, allow them to grow um, in between mowing, um, and, um, and then we'll um, support um, a lot of bees because of all of the nectar and pollen that comes from these weeds. Now, violets are native, um, dandelions are not native, although they grow everywhere in the Northern Hemisphere, so maybe they are native. Um, and all of the other plants that grow, uh, weeds that grow on our lawn um, are mostly non-native, but they do serve to support small bees. Okay, let's change gears. I wanna talk a little bit about mulch um, because we have all learned to mulch this way, I think unless there's some very young gardeners who um, maybe have never known any other way, but you can go just about anywhere and, um, and the landscapes that we see in our community are mulched. Um, they look kind of like this. Um, so this is a wood chip product or a bark product. Um, some mulches are um, ground up leaf mulch. Um, they're all organic. They're all, um, you know, they're, they're all, um, probably good products, safe products to use. And of course, um, the old adage is that having a layer of mulch on the ground will do two things. It will, um, it will keep the soil moister longer and, um, and that'll prevent um, drought from su uh, causing suffering. Uh, the other thing it does covers the soil so that we do not get weeds germinating. Um, and if you look at the way these, these plants are installed, they're pretty far apart. There's maybe um, one and a half to two or two and a half feet um, of space between the plants. And if you didn't have this mulched and you had bare soil, it would produce a ton of weeds. Um, so basically, though, what I want to tell you is that when you mulch in this conventional way, um, you have to apply it usually a couple times a year. You have to apply it in late winter and then it gets thinned out by mid to late summer and you may apply a little bit more at that time. Um, and it's a constant chore of adding brown mulch year after year after year. So mulch basically means that um, you have a certain level of maintenance going on. But it also means that you're gonna have decreased wildlife. Yes, the plants in the picture are all native plants. Yes, those plants are gonna be promoting wildlife, but there's something else to think about, something else that I have discovered in recent years um, that is so very important. When we cover the ground with um, wood chips or leaf mulch, um, we are um, getting rid of the habitat for clearwing moths. If you're a seasoned gardener, you've probably seen these clearwing hummingbird moths flying around in the garden. They have these transparent wings. Um, they look kind of like a hummingbird. They're smaller than a hummingbird, but they hover like a hummingbird, which is why they call them a hummingbird moth. But they are truly moths. Um, without uh, natural leaf litter on the ground, um, we don't have luna moths. Um, luna moths are about six inches long um, and about six inches wide. They're one of the bigger and more beautiful of the moths that we have. Um, and io moths. I mean, if we didn't have leaf litter on the ground, just natural leaf litter, I'll show you what I mean here in a second, we would not have io moths. Um, all of these moths in the fall of the year um, generate a cocoon in natural leaf litter. Um, it is so well hidden in the leaf litter that um, they're virtually impossible to find. I, I've found them occasionally, um, even when you're hunting for them, they're really difficult to see. 
Um, this is the Whitmer Wildflower Garden, by the way. This is um, this is us not raking up the leaves. Um, this is what our garden looks like in many areas where we are letting tree leaves fall to the ground. Not everywhere, but in many areas, we're keeping tree leaves right where they lay, right where they fall. And because this is the place where you are going to find the, um, the luna moth cocoon rolled up in a leaf like you can barely see here. This is what it looks like. Um, this is what a woolly bear caterpillar um, cocoon looks like in the wintertime. Maybe you've seen these in a pile of leaf litter um, on at the corner of your house. And by the way, this is what a woolly bear caterpillar looks like. You've probably seen these caterpillars uh, walking around in the fall. Um, they are looking for leaf litter. And when they find it, they um, pupate into a cocoon that virtually disappears um, amongst the leaf litter. And if you're curious what a woolly bear looks like, um, they eventually turn into a, a beautiful tiger moth. And there's some different species of woolly bears um, and tiger moths in Missouri. Um, these are really spectacular creatures. Um, they all exist in leaf litter. They all require leaf litter to survive. And, um, and by the way, um, there are lots of other uh, critters that live in leaf litter in the wintertime, not just some of these beautiful, spectacular moths, um, but there are butterfly species. Um, and there are lots of other insect species that live in leaf litter. So I challenge you to think about um, reducing the amount of mulch, of conventional mulch that you put in your garden. I challenge you to leave natural leaf litter on the ground in 50% of your garden spaces, at least. Try to get some of your garden spaces with natural leaf litter because there, it really will make a difference to, um, to many of these, um, these species of of moths and butterflies. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, cutting back stems at the end of the season. Um, but I want to back up and say, um, ask how many of you, uh, I know that you're not going to be able to respond, but, um, but how many of you um, learn to cut your plants back in the fall? So at the end of summer, during fall, before winter happens, um, have you ever cut all of the stems in your garden down at that time? Um, I, we used to call it um, putting the garden to bed. Um, so cutting all the stems down, right down to the ground level. Um, before winter. Um, but what I've learned is that um, it's good to leave, keep your stem standing through the winter months. Um, one, uh, things like wild bergamot and many other things are beautiful in the wintertime. Um, they create interest in the winter. Um, the seed heads um, catch snow, they freeze up, and they um, they gather ice crystals in a really beautiful way. Um, they're also edible. Um, there's a small percentage of seeds that remain in the seed heads of, of plants, and birds will pick on them in the winter months, especially when there is snow on the ground. So this is what our gardens look like um, in the winter time. This is a photograph from uh, a new favorite. It's not new. It's been there for a while, but a favorite native plant garden of mine at the Butterfly House, at the Sophia Sachs Butterfly House um, over in um, Chesterfield. Um, really beautiful gardens there, lots of native plants to look at. And, um, and this, is, uh, this is a scene that you can um, appreciate throughout all of winter. Um, now, do we keep these stems standing uh, indefinitely? No, we don't. There's something different that we're doing to these stems in the springtime, not in the fall, but in the springtime is when we start cutting these stems down. And um, we're not cutting them all the way to the ground. So um, that's something that's different. You're going to have a little bit of twigginess if you leave um, 10 to 12 inches of stems sticking out of the ground. Um, the twigginess might look 
um, unkempt. It might look like you forgot to cut it all the way to the ground. Um, kind of like having leaves sitting on the surface of the soil and uh, throughout the winter months. Um, it's something that most of us are just not used to. And, um, but I'll tell you that, um, that it's really worth it. It's really um, a vital practice to keep your stems, um, uh, cutting them back uh, eight to 10 inches is really great. 12 inches is good. Um, if you can stand 14 inches, 14 inches is good too. And the reason is, um, according to Heather Holm and lots of other um, bee biologists, um, bees need these stems to lay their eggs. So once we cut the stem off, um, and usually we're doing it in March, um, once we cut these stems off, it provides an opening to the pith, to the center of the stem, where tiny native bees can drill down and lay their eggs. Those eggs will stay in the stems until the following spring or summer, and they will hatch out a year later. So once you cut these stems high, you never touch them again. And the new foliage in April will start growing up through these dead stems, and the stems will disappear within a matter of weeks. Um, the green vegetation will um, grow out beyond the eight to 10 inches or 12 inches. Um, and, um, and then it'll be a green mass of plants again. And then hidden down in that um, clump of foliage will be your old stems. Um, and the bees will find those stems and drill into them and lay eggs. Now, um, the first year we did this at Shaw Nature Reserve was right after we saw Heather Holmes' presentation at a partner's workshop like this one. And we came back and um, we realized that we cut all of the stems down. Um, they were all cut down and gone. So we went out and um, we found some sumac uh, plants and we cut sumac stems and came back to the garden and jabbed them in the ground. And sure enough, bees came and colonized in those, um, in those stems. Um, here's the sumac stems that we jabbed in the ground. Uh, you can see a little bee that uh, has his head poking up, looking back at us out of the hole that he just drilled into the pith. Um, here is um, another uh, bee that, a really tiny native bee that is drilling a hole in um, wild bergamots. Um, now that wild bergamot stem is about um, it's about that big. <laughs> it's about a, uh, a little bigger than an eighth of an inch in, in across. So that's a really small bee that's drilling into that pith. Um, every stem that we um, prepared in the garden had bee drilling evidence. Um, every stem that, or most of the stems that we now um, produce by clipping in the garden by June um, have a hole drilled in them. There are bees that are utilizing these cut stems. And, um, and I really think that it's important for us to, to start to think differently about how we cut our gardens back. Um, let's cut them high. Let's tolerate a little bit of stubble. Um, it is going to be um, really valuable for, uh, for the bees in our gardens, in our communities. It's just, and it's a really simple thing to do. It's really not um, all that complicated. Okay, now I wanna talk a little bit about um, garden maintenance. Um, and in order to, to get the maintenance right, um, you need to think about your capacity. Um, in order to get the amount of garden uh, right. Um, how much garden can you care for? Everybody gardens differently. Everybody gardens at a different pace. Everybody has a different family situation. Everybody has a different work situation. Um, but I really think it's important to think about um, what your situation is. And, um, and then if you're a new gardener, start small. Uh, again, start with 150 square feet or 200 square feet of garden see how that goes and then move on from there. Um, the other thing to think about is that there are different 
styles of garden. And every style of garden um, has a different maintenance requirement. Um, conventional gardens have plants grouped in masses. And the plant, the species may be repeated along a garden area, but, um, but this is pretty familiar, a pr pretty familiar style of gardening. There's a lot of um, groupings of plants. There's mulch between those groupings of plants. Typically, um, I would want to encourage you to use leaf litter if you can. Um, but this style of garden requires uh, more maintenance. Uh, more maintenance because plants try to move around. And if you want to maintain the integrity of this design, um, you may be digging up plants as they migrate. Um, you may find that one plant starts bumping into the other. And so you need to remove it to make more space um, for the, the, the other plant that's not as aggressive. Um, so there's lots of maintenance that's involved with this kind of a landscape. Um, the other thing that, that you find with a conventional garden is that it tends to not have as much um, species diversity and plant species diversity. And as a result, it doesn't have as much wildlife um, diversity that's attracted to it as well. Um, now, this looks like it, um, a garden with pretty good diversity. There's probably six or seven different kinds of plants here. Um, and it's a fairly big space. Um, the smaller the space, the, re the fewer numbers of plants, the fewer numbers of species can grow in, uh, in those smaller gardens. And then you're gonna, um, not going to have as much um, for the wildlife to come in and take advantage of. So I want to show you some numbers um, just to give you, um, give you an idea of, um, of how these garden styles can differ from one another. Um, I think of a conventional garden like the one I just showed you as requiring on average about seven minutes per square foot per year to take care of. Um, seven minutes per square foot. Now you can do the math and, um, and figure this out. A 250 square foot garden um, will take about, um, it'll take less than an hour a week to maintain. Um, and that's based on garden maintenance um, eight months out of the year, not 12 months out of the year, because in the wintertime, we, we're not doing a whole lot. Um, and by contrast, if you think of um, a much bigger garden, um, let's say a thousand square foot garden, um, you can expect to spend two to five hours per week taking care of that garden. Um, and so this might be a, a helpful guide um, as you're thinking about how much garden to create, how much garden to start with, I suggest in starting with less than 250 square feet of garden space. But as you discover your capacity, you can increase um, the size of your garden. You can add new gardens um, or not, depending on uh, how you feel about it um, as you start getting into it. A conventional garden um, can be fairly complex like you see in this photograph from SWT Design in, in St. Louis. Um, gardens don't stay like this forever. They grow, they change, they morph into something that looks like this. This is the same garden um, a year later. And um, what you'll find as a gardener, if you, if you haven't discovered this already, is that seedlings will pop up here and there um, that some plants are more aggressive than others and they bump into their neighbors and even take over their neighbors. So in order to maintain the integrity of this design, um, you need to do some thinning, you need to do some editing, you need to reduce the size of some of these masses um, be because otherwise the aggressive plants will take over, the less aggressive plants will get marched all over and disappear. Um, so there is a, quite a bit of design, uh, quite a bit of maintenance that goes into caring for these gardens that have a lot of design um, in them. Now let's look in contrast to a garden that is more naturalistic, a natural garden design. A design that, let me just throw a picture out, that looks like this. Um, this kind of garden um, is different because 
there are seedlings that spread around and the gardeners allow this to happen. Um, there are more individual plants because there is no mulch in this garden. All of the plants are tightly spaced together. All of the gaps have disappeared because every single square inch of garden has a plant growing in it. And so if you look at this, um, we oftentimes refer to these as tossed salad gardens. Um, and, um, but there are different levels of this kind of natural design style. A truly tossed salad style is where everything is allowed to move around and spread on their own and fill in. Um, two minutes per square foot per year to maintain this. Now remember we were talking seven inches, seven minutes per square foot for a conventional garden. Now we're talking two minutes per square foot. So reduce maintenance for this tossed salad style. Um, let's move on. A tossed salad or a naturalistic garden um, can be doesn't have to be really big. It can be quite small, like um, um, like this garden. Uh, this is at Doug Bauer's garden. Doug is um, with DJM Ecological Services, and um, his garden is in this part of the garden. It's not very big, but it is completely a toss salad. Um, there are nothing but native plants mixed into this space. Um, there's a, it's a nice array, a nice variety of native plants in this garden space. Um, but when you have plants growing in a toss salad fashion, very close together like this, um, you do tend to have um, higher plant diversity. There are more plants per square yard. And the other thing that you, um, you get with this is lower maintenance. So again, because there are so many plants filling up the spaces in between each other, um, there are less chances for weeds to encroach. And so maintenance is reduced. Now there's still weeds that come into gardens like this. They are not weed free, but maintenance does tend to go down. Now, there's another type of garden style that, um, that we've been um, taking advantage of for many, many decades, ground covers. Um, ground covers um, really um, reduce the amount of maintenance. Um, you can see ground cover plantings are reduced down to about one minute per square foot to um, take care of, um, which is half that of a naturalistic garden. Um, but ground covers historically have been things like English ivy, winter creeper, euonymus, periwinkle. These three evergreen ground covers are now considered invasive plants. They take over natural areas and they outcompete um, native plants in woodlands. So this is really not, these are really bad species. They're highly inappropriate. Um, they're causing hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of um, repairs to our natural woodland environments. So we wanna get away from this, but if you want to have the, um, the low maintenance effect of a ground cover, there are native plants that um, you can choose that can do something similar. Now here's Pennsylvania sedge. Um, Pennsylvania sedge is very low maintenance because um, it grows pretty densely. Now, if you look at this photograph, um, you'll see that there are some weeds that are growing in this Pennsylvania sedge. Um, I'm also standing on it. I don't think that it can handle um, heavy foot traffic. Again, there are no plants that do the same thing as turf grass in terms of withstanding foot traffic. Um, but, this is a, um, but this is a low ground cover plant that can be maintained with a lawnmower. It only needs to be cut uh, once or twice a year. And, um, and it, it um, is a low maintenance plant. It's a great performer in our, in our landscape as a ground cover and a good alternative for some of these invasive ground covers. Um, one that grows in, in shady places, golden groundsel. Um, this, is a, this is one that fills in um, very quickly, very aggressively and makes a really good ground cover. Here's what it looks like when it's blooming in April. And here's what it looks like um, all the rest of the year. It is an evergreen plant, really nice ground cover. Now, the downside is it's one species. 
So it's not going to have a lot of species uh, wildlife diversity that comes to it. It's low species diversity. The upside is that it's very low in maintenance. So um, you'll have to um, decide for yourself what is appropriate and what is not. Um, some basic things to consider. I'm just sort of going over um, in general um, this whole presentation. Think about how much time you have as a gardener. Um, if you have extra time on your hands, if you love being outside and tinkering in the garden, um, you will have the ability to take on more garden space. Um, how much experience do you have? Do you have much experience? Um, maybe, maybe not. Um, you might want to um, get some help, have somebody come in and show you, um, give, show you a thing or two, or maybe design your whole garden or take care of your whole garden. The horticulture industry is moving more and more toward um, providing native landscaping services. It's really good news. How much help do you have? Um, you might be involved in a community project um, at a, a park or a church or fill in the blank. Um, these are great opportunities to, um, to, to join with your friends and your colleagues and um, to, um, to do something great in the community. Um, so the amount of people that you have helping um, will affect how much um, garden space you convert and take care of. Um, and also, um, you, 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 you need to pay attention to the bottom line. I mean, how much money is it going to take? Um, not all gardens, um, uh, some gardens are totally free. Uh, you can get away with very low budget. Um, but uh, here's a community garden project on South Korean that I think is really great because um, the South Korean improvement, um, business improvement district didn't have all the money it needed to take care of all of these wonderful gardens along the South Grand Avenue. And so they created a partnership with a contractor and a, with two contractors, um, one that did, does the, uh, some of the maintenance and the other one, which is a volunteer group that um, Eco Landscaping is um, Angie Weber and how she um, um, coordinates volunteers to help make up the the loss of all of the funding in this particular project. Um, so you can, uh, there are really creative ways to make projects, especially bigger projects like this one succeed. Um, having volunteers involved um, is, is a great way to make projects very, very successful. Um, you will have, um, by the way, so I wanted to mention a couple resources, uh, a couple more resources. Um, you will have lower maintenance if you can find plants that, that deer don't like to eat. So uh, you could, for example, go to our chapter four landscaping guide, which is available online at Shaw Nature Reserve uh, on our website. You can download a PDF or you can come to our visitor center and buy a copy. Um, and there are four chapters, chapters one through four that help you um, learn how to do um, every aspect of native gardening. Um, the other thing that can be helpful to you is if you go to the Grow Native website, uh, which is a part of the Missouri Prairie Foundation, um, they have a series of garden designs on their website. And these garden designs can be very useful to you as you are trying to um, group plants together in a design that's gonna work for your space, for you. And uh, so I think they have um, maybe 10 different sample garden designs that you can um, go and look at and reproduce uh, if you want to, or reproduce parts of them, um, because they um, are full of the best native plants, the um, top performing native plants. And um, I think I'm going to leave it at that. And Sarah, if um, you would like to come back and um, pull any questions from the chat, I would be very happy to take the last few minutes to answer any questions you may have. Oh, yeah, we have um, some questions, but um, I think you dealt with several of them with those last recommendations. So thank you. <laughs> we always have questions about uh, avoiding deer or deterring deer. So I think that helps. But there was one question I found really interesting um, that someone posed the first time that I've heard someone suggest that they have 
plants that they've planted just for deer and is that enough of a deterrent or do they need to you know will they eventually encroach on the rest of the the garden if they have foraging plants um or can they do other things or should they do other things as well um so that's true that's a tricky question to answer because everybody's po deer population is different um some deer herds um, have a liking to one type of plant or one group of plants and not another. And I, some, we did a, um, a three-year deer survey um, in, near Rockwood Reservation in St. Louis, where we grew 100 native species for three years, and we observed what, um, what deer ate and what they didn't eat. And the results of that study are in this chapter four native landscaping guide that I just mentioned that is available at Shaw and on our website. Um, and sometimes when I talk about that or give that presentation, some, somebody will raise their hand and say, oh, well, I had that plant completely eaten in my garden. <laughs> and especially when I'm presenting to people from other parts of the state. Um, and so um, it's really tricky to um, to predict what deer will do, what they will, what they'll eat, what they won't eat, and it also has to do with how hungry they are. Um, and so, if they don't have a lot of food resources available to them, um, they might eat all of the plants that you put in your yard for them, and then everything else beyond that. And so, it, it just really it's a it's a moving target. It's very difficult to predict and. Um, I'm sorry. It's really it's a hard subject to to broach. It is it, no. I don't think any. I don't think any of us can be truly happy with the answer because there is no one answer, as you pointed out very well. Thank you for that. But um, there was also some questions about rabbits, and I just want to mention too that um, Dave Tilka talked about what he does to help deter rabbits and his uh, partners for Native Landscaping webinar from two weeks ago. Um, uh, the three year three year suburban landscape makeover so that is posted on youtube if folks want to dive into that unless you have any uh any, any magical insight on other kinds of past, uh, animal pests that we might have in our gardens or uh well i know rabbits are tricky and i do i think going to dave's talk and listening to him is going to be a good way to go um there are some things that um, you'll discover that rabbits really like to eat um, they like to eat clematis um, among many other things um, in some cases it's a good idea to put a small bit of rabbit fence around your new garden especially if it's a small garden um, if you put a low two foot rabbit fence around it um, at least until it gets established, um, then you have a better chance of it making it um, in the long run. Um, when you put a small plant in the ground, it's a very small target for a rabbit. Um, it has human scent on it, so they're curious. Chipmunks and squirrels are also curious about human scents, and so they're just attracted to these new th things that you put in the ground. So anything new, you should probably try to protect with a small bit of um, chicken wire or some kind of wire fenced, at least for the first growing season. Um, that's one tip that I would that I would give. Um, having happy, healthy um, hawk populations is another another thing that you can't control, I know. But um, if you have a lot of hawks in your neighborhood, those can be a good thing. They can they are putting pressure on your rabbits and your um, your other um, mammals that are um, small enough for them to catch and eat. Great, thank you so much. Um, yeah, that has been part of the discussion too, I think over the couple of weeks is that, yeah, the more we have native plants, the more the, hopefully the ecosystem will be able to kick in and help manage some of these things for us. Um, I wanna come back to the um, the leaf litter and mulching questions. We had a lot of, um, a lot of questions kind of overlapping about that topic. Um, some, a lot of the questions did relate to is it pot, like is it a good idea to if we leave it if we're leaving leaf litter if we're leaving our leaves um can you kind of move them to certain parts of the yard to help keep the the things that are you know nesting there and and doing their their things um is that an okay approach or should we just leave it where it is and uh in order to have the best outcome for those creatures uh, well if you uh, keep in remember the woolly bear caterpillar 
and uh, we start seeing woolly bears crawling around um, late in the season, usually in October, maybe a little bit in early November. Um, but in October, those woolly bears are crawling around and they are looking for, um, for freshly fallen leaves. Um, so leaves start, depending on the species, leaves start falling off of the trees at the end of October and um, in early November. And um, so they're crawling around looking for leaf litter. If they have already um, um, turned into cocoon in the leaf litter and rolled up in some leaf somewhere, um, I suppose if, you, if it's a big enough cocoon, if it's a big enough, resilient enough species, it can be raked up and deposited someplace else. Um, but in general, I think it's important to keep leaf litter where, where, it, where it falls. Um, and the reason is there's a whole bunch of other little tiny critters, not those large cocoons that are pretty resilient to, to a, a leaf rake, but lots of small things that are um, either in the laying on the ground or in the upper surface um, of the leaf litter, I mean the lower surface of the leaf litter, um, that can be damaged when you rake up the leaves and move them to a different spot. I think the key here is thinking about what you and your neighbors can tolerate. There are the front walkway that goes maybe from the sidewalk up to the front door of your house. That's sort of front and center, and you might want to continue to mulch conventionally in a location like that, but maybe around the side of the house or maybe um, elsewhere, in a secondary location in your landscape, that might be a good place to practice keeping leaves in place, like I suggested. Um, as I said, it's a, it's a tough pill to swallow. Some of these practices that I'm talking about don't look right in the beginning to a beginner gardener or to uh, not a beginner gardener, but a seasoned gardener, because we've been taught to rake up all the leaves. We've been taught to mulch all of the ground. We've been taught to cut the plants back all the way down to ground level. And so to do otherwise makes the garden look a little bit messier. Um, but what I found is over time, people start to realize that that is the way that it should be. That's the way it's supposed to look. And if you can understand that uh, the wildlife benefit from gardening that way, then I think that people really do eventually come around. Great. I think um, there's it's always like a, a balance, right? Because people are worried about um, other pests who then have like cover from their natural predators, maybe more cover than they might otherwise have if there's leaves and things. But I guess, you know, each person has to kind of decide what their comfort level is, I suppose. If they don't want their plants destroyed by voles, then maybe <laughs> they have to make a choice. But um, I know that, you know, there are a lot of these things, because someone else mentioned with it came to the um, stemming of the um, of plants, taking removing the tops, that um, they were told to to take those off, uh, those cut those stems down to prevent fungal growth. And so again, is that a concern that outweighs the benefits of leaving this the stems? You know, I don't know what you think about that. <laughs> um, well, I I'm not worried about fungal growth. Um, I, I found that, um, that fungal growth on some native plant species, um, it does happen, um, but it's, it's far less than on a lot of non-native species. So the, the species of fungi that um, exist in our environment have been evolving here in our region alongside the native plants for hundreds of thousands of years. And so in general, there's a tolerance um, that native plants have built up for, for example, uh, um, an organism like a fungi. So a certain amount of fungi is acceptable. I find that um, some years are worse than others. Um, and um, in a moist year, you'll find more, mo you'll find more fungi uh, building up on monarda leaves, for example, or garden phlox leaves. Some years, um, a more normal year, you won't see much at all or maybe none. And so um, I'm not really too, con too concerned with fungi on native plants. It, I've never seen it become such a problem that it causes the plant to um, diminish and um, shrink and 
and eventually die. It just doesn't happen. All right, good to know. Um, so then some of the other things that folks were asking about um, had to relate to, oh, a lot of, lot of follow-up questions while you're talking about the leaf litter. Um, a lot of folks are interested, is there like a specific time in the spring when they should look to remove um, last seed, last fall's leaves from their yard? Um, is there a time to rake up the leaves? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, no, like a spring cleanup. <laughs> no, we're talking about um, keeping the leaf litter, mm -hmm. and not raking up the leaves, not even in spring. Because think about what happens in spring. Um, by the second week of April, plants start growing. And when that green lush growth comes up in the garden, um, it makes just about everything around it um, disappear. Um, the, um, there's a garden in Chicago called the Lurie Garden. It's between the Contemporary Art Museum and the, um, uh, the Frank Gehry Amphitheater. Um, it's an outdoor park at Millennium Park. And it is the most visited garden on the planet. Um, they've done the numbers. There's so many, I don't know how many millions of people go through that garden every year. Um, it is the most visited garden on the planet. And um, their garden practice in the spring is to cut all of the plants, all of the stems um, with a string trimmer or with um, hedge shears and leave all of the clippings sitting on the ground. Um, and they do this in, in winter and in late winter. Um, and they know that it has, um, um, it looks like a bunch of clippings sitting on the ground. But they also know that come uh, later in April, because things grow a little bit later in Chicago, um, it all disappears really quickly when the plants start emerging from the ground. So it is a practice that is new. It's a practice that is not conventional. It's something that is a little bit different for most people. And, um, but it is a practice that, um, that is highly beneficial. Um, and, and it's something that people can learn to live with. If the garden that has more people in it can tolerate it, um, then we all should be able to tolerate it. Excellent example. And I put a link in there so everyone can take a look at that <laughs> um, in, in the chat there. Um, so also we had some, questions about um, turf. Uh, well, I guess in terms of uh, two questions about about turf. One, when it comes to creating pathways, is it better for wildlife in our yards to have turf or to have like um, stone pathways, that sort of thing? Do you have any thoughts or recommendations on that? I don't think I've thought about that. Um, usually when I think about turf versus um, stone pathways versus gravel pathways. I think about what my budget is. I think about what my maintenance um, capacity is because it's gonna take more maintenance to maintain a flagstone path than a mowed turf path. I mean, with mowed turf, you just cut it uh, with a lawnmower or a string trimmer. Um, and with a, with a stone path, you have to hand weed the edges maybe. Um, until the plantings get established, um, that, that may be a consideration. Flagstone costs a considerable amount of money. And if you want somebody to install it, it costs even more. Um, you may be installing it yourself, that'll cut down some of the cost, um, but the raw materials are, are still um, fairly expensive. So it's gonna be cheaper to have a mowed turf grass path. I would recommend no matter what you do, um, to try to have a path that's 10 feet wide. Okay. Um, if it's less than 10 feet and you and decide to go with a naturalistic style, then the plants at the edge can kind of lean in and block the pathway. So really narrow pathways completely get blocked very easily. Wider pathways, um, it's a little bit more forgiving. It's a little bit easier to, to take care of. You may not have 10 feet of space and because your garden might be really small. So make it as wide as you can. Make it eight feet if you can. Make it minimum six feet. I say minimum 10 feet, but you know it's kind of relative. It kind of depends on your garden space. You may have a very small garden space, space and you may need to do a little trimming. Mm -hmm. Good points. Um, 
yeah, <laughs> it is hard to to visualize sometimes what you're working with when you're starting with your seeds or your small plants. So that's a good good point for sure. Um, the other question was you mentioned um, the maintenance time per square square foot. Um, someone asked about the time for maintaining that much lawn. Is there do you have a, a number for that for to compare apples and oranges? Yeah, <laughs> um, I do. But um, so here's the thing, though. Well, I'll give you the number first. Uh, and here, actually, I have it right here. Um, so mow turf. Um, I, I knew this question would come up, so I threw <laughs> the slide in here. Um, on average, 7.5 seconds per square foot. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a, a very small amount of time compared to any kind of garden. And um, but what you don't realize here is the there's a lot of costs involved with mowing grass, and the costs um, involve fuel, um, machine maintenance, repairs, and the cost of the environment for all of that exhaust that comes off of that machine. Not to mention the noise pollution that bugs all the neighbors. Um, so there are a lot of costs involved that are not reflected in this number that I throw up on this, on this slide. Um, this is just simply how much time does it take to cut grass? Now, um, it can be more than this if you have lots of trees that you have to go around and trim. It can be more if you have lots of sidewalks where, the, where you're trimming the edges of the sidewalks. If you don't have any of that, then the maintenance time goes way down. Um, well, not, I mean, it's five seconds versus 10 seconds per square foot. Um, so there's the answer. I mean, turf grass doesn't take a lot of time because our equipment goes so fast. Um, but the equipment has a cost associated with it. Yeah, good. Um, yeah, it's important to, to keep in mind, like with, with the other, with like with the pathway you mentioned, like there's more than just <laughs> one aspect of the questions to consider for sure. Um, I think that's most of the, the kinds of questions. I did have a question that um, kind of early on about um, having native yards, native planted yards, um, where you have a strict homeowners association. Um, I know, I, I believe Doug Tallamy's book, uh, Best um, Nature, no, I'm going to, Nature's Best Hope, uh, talks a little bit about those, but is there things that people could keep in mind to advocate for na native gardens? Well, uh, you, you know, um, more than anybody, what your homeowner association is going to tolerate and what they're not. Um, there was a study that was done at the University of Minnesota many, many years ago where um, grad students went from home, home to home and neighborhood to neighborhood with three different photographs or, or three different renderings of what their garden could look like. One of them had just a few plants, maybe a tree and some shrubs and a small flower bed. Very, very conventional, very, very small and not very intense. Another one where the garden was completely full of garden, um, very little turf grass, lots of trees, lots of shrubs. And then the third photograph was somewhere in between these two extremes. And they, they asked people what they thought would be toler what they would tolerate in their landscape. And more often than not, people were way more willing to tolerate landscapes that were full of plants than they ever, ever dreamed of. Mm -hmm. The trick to doing it is to making um, the garden look intentional and making it intentional. Um, having pathways, having um, maybe using conventional um, types of gardening practices like hedges, have a hedge that is in front of a very natural and wild um, toss salad type garden. Um, having benches or maybe having places where people can sit out in the garden to invite them in, or at least to make it look like um, it is being used and it's intentional. Intentionally using some turf grass to create margins or borders to your beds is a great way to define those gardens that look very wild. And um, 
And so and more often than not, it's really, um, it's about what you add to your garden to embellish it, to make it look more intentional, to frame it, and even identify it. Um, I remember uh, one gardener who made a sign, stuck it in the yard, and it said, this garden was the great garden contest winner of whatever year it was. <laughs> And it had a you know a smiley face or something, and you know that you know that justified <laughs> the garden. You know there was some um, somebody thought that they that it was great, and maybe the the award was fake or maybe it was real. I don't know. But you can get these little signs from Wild Ones and Grow Native and um, the lots of and Audubon and other groups that um, that says this garden is in harmony with nature. Um, this garden is, um, um, is, is intentional, it has native plants, it is, um, is here for the wildlife. Mm -hmm. And those signs can be um, beneficial to make your garden look um, even more intentional and more acceptable. And I'll, I'll end with one last story. And it's um, just a short story. A friend of mine planted a small garden that was very naturalistic, very, um, very toss salad-like in um, the Dogtown neighborhood adjacent to um, Forest Park. And she gathered up all the neighborhood kids to come over to her new garden and help her plant her garden. And <laughs> so all the kids came over. Uh, she was a really friendly person, by the way. She's very neighborly. Uh -huh. And when the kids went home after planting that garden and they told their mom and dad what they did, there was no way that anybody in that neighborhood could ever turn back and say, that is a weed patch, that garden doesn't belong in our community. Um, everybody embraced it, everybody loved it. Um, and so neighborliness is an <laughs> it's another key ingredient into how you can create gardens that people are gonna accept. And when you're neighborly and conversing over the fence, you're hopefully also sharing um, your intentions, sharing why, what's important about native plants and what's important about wildlife. And it, it goes a long way. Absolutely. That's, That's a genius plan. I'll have to remember that someday. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Scott, uh, for all of your insight and advice and uh, helping to ease us into uh, what might be new territory as far as some of these practices but um, those that will have really great benefits for our gardens and our, our neighborhood ecosystems at, at, at minimum. So thank you so much. You're welcome. My pleasure, Sarah. Thanks right. everybody. Thanks thank for you. coming. Take care everyone.